slit and an overflow. And they would come through with buckets of water and after the floor had been fouled, they washed it off the floor. Guess where the overflow went? To the inner prison. Now when you were in the stocks and you were chained, there was no way to move out of the way. There was no way to get away from it. There was no way to find a corner where the stench wasn't terrible. Paul and Silas are unjustly beaten. They're unjustly imprisoned. The city fathers are against them. They're chained in the lowest, worst, stinkingest part of a prison. Take a look at their response. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. You know, I was reminded of something this morning that I think is significant. In the military, when they train special forces people, they have a propensity to put them in the worst possible situations over and over and over to see who will quit. Matter of fact, there's one story that's told about when they train sea air land troops. Are you familiar with that term? It's better known as SEALs, Navy SEALs. And Navy SEALs have two things that begin in their training, 10 things they have to learn. The very first thing is how to make a bunk because every morning for nine weeks, every morning starts with an inspection of how they made their bunk. And the bunk had to be perfect because if your bunk wasn't perfect, everything perfectly spaced, your pillow perfectly centered on the headboard, your blanket perfectly folded and put across the end of the bed, your corners square with hospital corners, everything just right, no wrinkles whatsoever, you were given extra physical training. Extra PT, you're already exhausted. It didn't take very long that those people learn how to make a bunk and how to do it well. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Why, when you're training for such extremely significant things as a Navy SEAL has to face, what is this business with making your bed? There's a second thing that happens to a Navy SEAL every single day. Every single day, they have a, a uniform inspection. Nobody ever passes the uniform inspection. No matter how hard you polish that brass buckle, no matter how much starch you have in your hat, no matter how you've got things so that they're not wrinkled, no matter how you've shined your shoes, it makes absolutely no difference. Those who are the training officers find something wrong. And do you know what happens when they find something wrong? They take you down to the surf's edge. And when you get to the surf's edge, they make you wade into the breakers. And when you wade it into the breakers and you're soaking wet and cold, they make you roll in the sand in San Diego, the training station. And you may not wipe the sand off. And they tell you when you've got enough sand on you, they call it becoming a sugar cookie. And you must wear the sand and the wet clothes all day long and still perform. Those who never come to understand why they do that often ring the bell. All you have to do is quit in Navy SEAL training is go to the center of the promenade, the parade field, grab the rope on a large brass bell and ring the bell and you're out. You're free. Take a shower. We'll get you reassigned. Everything's fine. 
The mission of the instructors are to find those who cannot stay focused, regardless of the hardship that they're experiencing, because they will not be reliable to stand at a buddy's back when the time of trouble comes, because for a fighter, trouble will come. And if you can't stand up for a buddy, when everything has gone south, you've got no place in that unit. Paul and Silas are in the inner prison. The last week of Navy SEAL training is called Hell Week. The average Navy SEAL company starts at the beginning of training with 150 people. By this time, they are usually down between 30 and 40. Others have rung the bells. And in the last week, they have an interesting little trip. In the last week, nobody gets any sleep. Everybody is kept wet. As a matter of fact, there's an area between Tijuana and San Diego where an estuary floods with fresh water over the top of a mud flat into the ocean. <clears throat> and they take these guys out and they put them in the mud flat knowing that they are going to sink almost to their neck. And they keep them in that while they scream and harass and they make all the trouble they can. And they tell them constantly, all you gotta do is ring the bell. All you gotta do is ask, it will help you out of the mud. They're cold, they're shivering, they're near hypothermic. Morale begins to fade. Everything is against them. Some begin to lose hope. There's a story about one particular group that found themselves in that circumstance. <clears throat> Everybody just looked at each other as the drill instructors screamed and railed. And then one young man began to sing. He began to sing a hymn. He began to sing the halal from the Psalms. And he sang, and the drill instructors came, and they screamed at him and said, Stop that singing, we're giving you more time in the mud. And he refused. And then two began to sing as they began to learn the words. And then four, as the drill instructors kept screaming. And then finally, all the cadets began singing. And when they heard the words and they came to understand the hope that was in those words, they were ready to die in that hypothermic state. But I'll be darned if they were going to ring that bell. There is a possibility as we began this chapter that Paul may have thought back, maybe even every day, on a young man named John Mark. And the fact that he couldn't find it in himself to extend that young man grace. That Barnabas, who had stood by him, now with John Mark, knew what it was to give somebody grace to help develop them. You know, I find it interesting. I've, been around a lot of people management-wise, having been a manager myself. And there are people around the industry that I'm from, it's a real small industry and there are very few people who have licenses to do what I did. And at any rate, as a result, you run into these people over the years in different places. Because there's only so many people to choose from to hire for those jobs. And it's amazing how some learn an important lesson and others never do. 
And the ones that never do frequently have failures and they always have the same complaints about how lousy their employees are. Those that come around and come to understand what it is to meet their employer's requirements and what it takes to do that come away with a very different point of view. You know what they learn? They learn that if people who work for you don't have some predisposition to success, things will never work. So what are you talking about? Do you know why they have Navy SEALs make their bed every morning? It's the same reason when I started the inductive Bible study class in seminary, they made us do something that didn't seem like it had anything to do with. They knew how difficult the task was going to be to learn that on a graduate level. And so you know what they had us do? They had us learn to draw a map of Israel. I remember it to this day. And frank, frankly, it made me a little angry until I understood. I thought, this is so simplistic. You're throwing all this stuff for inductive Bible study at us, and you want me to draw a map of Israel? Give me a break. I've got enough on my plate. And one at a time, they had us come up. And they had us draw a map of Israel throughout the course of the class. We see they explained it to us at the end. They said we knew how difficult this is going to be with the foreign languages, with the grammar. Some of you in school have never had that kind of grammar before. I went to a San Francisco public school, shoot half the kids in my class and couldn't speak English. We never had diagramming grammar. I'll tell you, I was choking. They said, we need to give you a task that we knew you could succeed at so that when you came away from your study and things had been hard, that you could look at that silly map and say, I did that. I can do this. I can make that. And every morning a Navy Steel would stand up and when they would pass the inspection for having made their bunk. Even if the day had been the worst day in the world, they knew they were coming back to a perfectly made bunk. And they did it. And one of the things that those fellow managers never learned, management's the business of getting things done through other people, not doing it yourself. And until you learn to gain the willing cooperation of other folks, you will never get what you need done, done. It's the skill of not just pushing people to meet your expectations. It's providing them with an atmosphere of development where they can eventually gain the skill. Part of us knew it. He knew that sometimes it was three steps forward and two steps back. But he knew eventually it would be a step forward every time. Paul now is involved with two young men, Timothy and Titus. And he takes Timothy on. Now we know from what is written in the second chapter of Timothy that Paul is having some real thoughts about John Mark. He writes to Timothy whom he calls in 1 Timothy, my own son. And he says, please bring me the scrolls I need him badly. He's in the inner prison in Rome at the last. 
And he says, listen, and could you bring my coat? Winter's coming on and it's getting cold. Oh, one more thing. Could you bring John Mark with you? He's become a real blessing to me. Possible translation. Barnabas knew what he was doing. He brought this young man up. He's become profitable to the kingdom. Maybe Paul regretted his first encounter with John Mark because he knew he had a very limited part in the success that John Mark had become. Now, Paul is in the inner prison with Silas. He's in the stock. He's become a sugar cookie. They've tried to kill him and they beat him before. He wore that sand and that cold uniform days. He knew what it was to do the very best you know how and for things to still not seem to work out. But he begins to sing. And if you look at this in the Greek, he begins to sing the halal. The Psalms. He begins to sing of the glory of God. And Silas picks it up and they hear it in the inner prison. Two men in the most miserable of circumstances falsely accused and they are glorifying and magnifying God. Quick analogy, things the worst they could get, cold, covered with sand, everything bad. And Paul is saying, I am not going to ring that bell. You see, all the trouble he had been through, even though he knew, just like those Navy SEALs, that no matter what you did, it could turn out wrong and still not quit. Paul had learned that lesson in the gospel. I don't care what happens. I don't care who goes. I don't care who stays. I am not going to forsake God in my life. I'm not going to accuse him. I'm not going to be angry with him. I am not going to, for, I am not going to forsake the grace he extended me or to the grace that I need to extend to others. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened from a sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill him. Now, the conventional wisdom is that the jailer knowing he was a Roman jailer in a Roman jail in a Roman colony, would be subject to the condition of Roman law that said, if you were given charge of prisoners and they escape, you must serve their sentence. But I can tell you, having been a deputy sheriff and having worked in a very large county jail, 600 inmates, having run the maximum security block in that, having seen some really ugly stuff happen. In one circumstance, I saw a group of prisoners that refused to come out when they had taken somebody inside hostage. And when myself and three other officers entered the block, which was an open block with 100 inmates, the inmates circled around us 
And I got to tell you, there were some thoughts about maybe we're not walking out of here. It was the custom in that jail, when something like that happened, they assembled what we called the goon squad. And these guys made a serious mistake when they did that because it was a shift change. And there were over a hundred officers who were there. And all 100 of the shift change officers filtered in around the outside. Tear gas in hand, batons in hand, ready to go. Three guys who were doing life down from the penitentiary stepped up in front of us and they turned to the other inmates and they said, let the officers go. And they pushed the young guys who were the insiders out of the way threatening to let them have it if they didn't move. And they escorted us out of the block. And the other officers came in, took those men into custody, and they were prosecuted for riot. Now you say, why do you bring that up? I know what it's like to be a jailer and to see nothing between you and those on the inside and to wonder what's gonna happen to you. I submit to you that I understand why this unsaved man might have preferred to take out a sword and take his own life rather than experience that. Just the thought of an old jailer. And Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul in silence. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, join the church, pay your tithes, join two or three of the clubs that we have here at the church. There's the women's group, the men's group, the kids' group. Didn't say any of that, did he? What did he say? <coughs> so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Now, there are those who actually espouse the position that if the father of the household gets saved, the whole household is saved. I do not believe that that's what's being said here. What he is saying here is, you respond to the message, and I have confidence that your family will see what it does in you, and that they'll accept Jesus as well. God has no grandchildren. If your parents are saved, it doesn't make you saved. If your parents have a good relationship with God, doesn't mean you have a good relationship. If your parents have a lousy relationship with God and are absolute hypocrites, it doesn't mean you have to be. Don't tag God with the sins of other people. He didn't do it. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of, of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Remember Paul in the sand, wet uniform, hours at a time? He's standing up giving a gospel message in an altar call while his back is still bleeding and while the pain is still very much part of what's going on with them. He knows what it is to be in discomfort. And when, it, and when it was day, the magistrates sent to the officers saying, let them go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart 
and go in peace. And Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they have put us out securely. Uh, put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them, let them come themselves and get us out. You've got to catch the significance of this dynamic. These guys who are part of the city in crowd show up to the magistrates. They say, hey, these guys have caused nothing but trouble. They've ripped us off out of the money that we were making from this slave girl. Huh? Do something. And they say, they're Jews. They don't have any rights. So they decide they're going to put the fear in these guys. They lock them up, throw them in the inner prison after they beat them to a pulp. And now they find out these men that know the Roman law, knowing that it's unlawful to do anything to a Roman citizen without a fair hearing. Now they find out these guys that they have unlawfully detained with no real charges, beaten them, and that they are in real trouble. If these guys make a complaint to Rome, they will lose their jobs in a heartbeat. They will no longer be running this city. You didn't do things like that. And they are freaked out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. Now, there's something here that's not said. This is a Roman city. Judaism is an approved religion in Rome. So these women meeting down by the riverside, ah, it's a group of women. And frankly, there's no big enclave of Jews here. They don't even have enough for a synagogue. As long as it was just Jews, we don't care. This Christus business, whatever that routine is, I don't know about that. So what would have happened if this whole thing with Paul and Silas hadn't happened? You say, well, what do you mean? Did you notice it said that the magistrates were afraid? If this gets back to Rome, we are toast. What kind of safety do you think that provided for a young church forming in Philippi? Yeah, these are the people the Philippian letters were written to. Everything looked bad when Paul and Silas are covered in sand or in the cold and are sugar cookies. Everything looked bad when their backs were bleeding and they're chained in an inner prison, but they've been through trouble before. They know there could be trouble again and they're not ringing that bell. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. The fact that the magistrates knew that if they came against the church at Philippi, all Paul had to do was write a letter to Rome and tell him what they did. God provided the church at Philippi with a lever. And it may well have preserved the church. You may find yourself in a troubling situation today. You may be tired of being covered with sand and in the cold and not being able to get out of it. You may be sick of being sick. Friend, if you continue to believe Jesus, if you hang on and you just don't ring the bell. 
something's going to come out of it and God can use it for His purpose. The question is, are you a washout? Or are you somebody that's learned the two lessons that Paul learned? Let people go and extend some grace. And secondly, the difficult situations of your life ultimately make you stronger. Don't ring that bell. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word today. God, I'm really sorry, and I feel for Paul and Silas having been beaten in the inner prison, the stuff they had to go through. But God, I am grateful for what we can learn out of it. Please have your way in us through this word. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.